Next, in the general formula, we're going to deal with the cash flow to bondholders. So I'm going to expand on that here. And cash flow to bondholders or cash flow to creditors, creditors is just another name for bondholders, is equal to the interest that you pay the bondholders. And this figure can be taken from the income statement minus net new borrowing. And that makes intuitive sense because if you're a bondholder and you lent this company money, basically the cash flows to you, you're going to be receiving interest. So that's going to be a cash inflow for you. But then if the company comes to you and they want to borrow even more money, that's going to be another outflow of cash for you. And then to further expand net new borrowing into detail, net new borrowing is just basically equal to your ending long-term debt minus your beginning long-term debt. So this whole bracket here represents the net new borrowing if we put that in brackets as well. So let's illustrate this through an example. Let's say that at the beginning of the year on a company's balance sheet, the long-term debt was at $10,000. And then at the end of the year on the balance sheet, the long-term debt rose to $12,000. And there was also interest paid of $500 during the year. So let's look at this example from the perspective of the bondholder. Let's pretend that you're the bondholder and you're lending this company this long-term debt. What are the cash flows to you? Well, the interest that the company pays you, that's a positive cash flow to you. So you're receiving that $500. So that's a positive. And now notice how the long-term debt figure went up on the company's balance sheet, meaning that they have more long-term debt, meaning that they borrowed more money from you. So they borrowed an extra $2,000 from you. So since they borrowed it from you, you had to give that money. That was an outflow for you. So that was a negative number. So basically $2,000 was borrowed additionally. So overall, the cash flow to you as the bondholder was a negative figure of $1,500. Now we could have also used this formula here. So we'd have interest of 500 minus in brackets, the ending long-term debt was 12,000. The beginning long-term debt was 10,000. So in this bracket would be the 2,000, which represents the net new borrowing, 500 minus 2,000. We get the same figure of negative $1,500. Now let's do another example, but let's switch these figures up. So now the beginning figure is $12,000 of long-term debt and the ending figure is $10,000 of long-term debt. So notice how the long-term debt went down instead of up like the other example. And then the interest is still $500 that's paid during the year. So let's switch it up in this case and let's plug these figures into the formula first and then we'll explain the intuition after. So we got the interest of $500 minus, in brackets, we got the ending long-term debt of 10,000 minus the beginning long-term debt of 12,000. So we got 500, minus, notice how 10,000 minus 12,000, that gives us a negative number of 2,000. And then negative, negative, that turns into a positive. So our net cash flow to bondholders is positive $2,500 in this case. So now let's try to intuitively think of this situation from the perspective of the bondholder. So again, you're the bondholder and you're lending this company this long-term debt. What are the cash flows to you? Well, the company is paying you interest of $500, so that's still a positive cash flow to you. But now notice how at the beginning of the year, the company started off with $12,000 worth of debt that they borrowed from you, and then at the end of the year, they only now owe $10,000, meaning that during the year, they paid you back $2,000. So because they're paying you that money back, that is a positive cash flow to you. So that $2,000 represents debt that is paid back. Another common word that comes up is redeemed in this situation. So when you see that a company has redeemed long-term debt, that means that they have paid back long-term debt, meaning the long-term debt went down. So it's a positive cash flow to the bondholders because they're paying them back, they're redeeming that debt. So then adding those figures up, we get positive $2,500 going to the bondholders or the creditors, and that's the same amount that we got when we just plugged it into the abstract formula.
And then finally, in the general formula, we're going to deal with the cash flow to shareholders. And the cash flow to shareholders, very similar to the intuition for the cash flow to bondholders. Instead of interest, though, we pay shareholders dividends. And then instead of minus net new borrowing, we'll have minus net new equity issued. So cash flow to shareholders equals dividends minus net new equity issued. And then this net new equity issued, so this portion of the formula here, we can expand further into detail. That's just equal to the ending common stock minus the beginning common stock. And those figures you could find in the equity portion of the balance sheet. Now to further expand on this, let's do a little review of accounting. So the equity portion of the balance sheet is generally split up into two portions, into common stock and into accumulated retained earnings. Now the common stock portion of the equity section on the balance sheet represents how much equity has been issued up to that point. So if you're an equity holder, it represents how much money you've given the company for them to buy the assets. While this second portion, accumulated retain earnings, that represents money that the company has made that is the equity holder's money, but it hasn't been paid to them yet. Think about it as money in a vault. So as an equity holder, it's money that's yours, but it's money that you don't necessarily have access to yet. It's not a cash flow to you yet. It's locked in a safe. So what happens is a company makes net income. You pull this figure from the income statement, and then a portion of the net income gets paid in dividends as a cash flow to shareholders. And the other portion of that net income gets retained. It gets locked in the vault. It goes into retained earnings. Now you may be asking yourself, why am I going into such detail talking about the equity portion of a balance sheet and talking about retained earnings and whatnot? And the reason is, is because you have to realize that this retained earnings portion of net income doesn't represent current cash flow to shareholders. Dividends we get currently, so that's why it's included in the cash flow to shareholders calculation, but the retained earnings is not paid to shareholders right away in the present moment. It gets locked into a vault and is potentially paid in the future. So when talking about cash flow to shareholders, we have to forget about this retained earnings portion of the equity section on the balance sheet and only look at this common stock portion and if it's changing or not. Because if this common stock portion is changing, then we know that there's some kind of cash flow happening to shareholders within that period in the present moment. So for example, let's say that at the beginning of the year, the common stock account of the equity portion of the balance sheet showed a $5,000 amount, and then at the end it showed a $7,000 amount, and then during the year we paid dividends of $1,000 to shareholders. Well, the cash flow to shareholders, the dividends, is a positive cash flow, so we know that they are getting $1,000, so that's a positive cash flow. But notice how this common stock account went up, meaning that the company took more money from the shareholders. They issued more equity. So because they issued more equity, the shareholders had to pay the money. It's a cash outflow for shareholders. So that 2,000 extra dollars is a negative cash flow. So 1,000 minus 2,000, that gives us a net cash flow to shareholders of negative $1,000. And if we also took these figures that we were given and plug them into the formula, ending common stock minus beginning common stock, that would be $2,000, dividends is 1,000, and then we end up getting to this portion of the equation. 1,000 minus 2,000 gives us that same negative net amount cash flow to shareholders of negative $1,000. Now what about another example with the beginning and ending values for the common stock account switch? So instead of the common stock account rising, now it's decreasing by $2,000. What does that mean? Well, cash flow to shareholders, they're still getting the dividends of $1,000, so that's a positive cash flow to them. But now, because the common stock account went down, that means that we've bought back shares or we're paying shareholders back $2,000. So they're receiving $2,000. So that's a positive cash flow to them. So 1,000 plus 2,000 
So the total cash flow to shareholders is $3,000. And we would also get the same answer if we plugged it into the formula. This bracket would be negative $2,000 and then we'd have 1,000 minus negative $2,000. Those two negatives turn into a positive and then we would get that final amount of 3,000. And let's do one more example. This one's going to be a lot tougher. So instead of it being a common stock account that increase, we're going to say that the whole equity account increased. And we don't know the common stock and retain earnings or accumulated retain earnings portion in the balance sheet. We just know that that full equity account went up by $2,000 from $10,000 to $12,000. And we also know during the year the company made a net income of $1,000 and $200 of that net income was retained. So what would the cash flow to shareholders be in this scenario? Well, let's use this diagram up here for this example. So we know the company made $1,000 of net income, $200 was retained, so the company must have paid out $800 worth of dividends because net income minus retained earnings gives us dividends. So $1,000 net income, $200 was retained, it was locked in the vault, and $800 was paid to shareholders as dividends. So going to the formula for the cash flow to shareholders, the dividends we already know, but how much new equity was issued or what was the change in the common stock account in the equity portion of the balance sheet? Well, we know from this information here that equity increased by $2,000 from $10,000 at the beginning of the year to $12,000 at the end of the year. And we know that the equity account is composed of common stock and accumulated retained earnings. So if the equity went up by $2,000, we know that $200 of that came from the retained earnings. So that means that the rest of the equity portion was increased by 1800 and that must have been a common stock increase. Okay, so one more time, the equity portion, the total equity portion of the balance sheet went up by $2,000. 200 of that dollars was an addition to retain earnings from the net income, this $200. So that means that the net of that, 2,000 minus 200, the other portion, 1,800, must have came from us issuing more stock or getting more money from equity holders, $1,800. So now looking at it from the shareholder's point of view, the shareholders got dividends of $800, so that's a positive cash flow, and the net new equity issued was $1,800. Notice how we weren't given the common stock, the ending and beginning common stock accounts, but we know that the common stock account increased by $1,800, meaning that we took more money from shareholders. So from the shareholders perspective, we gave more money to the company. We got $800 worth of dividends, but then we had to give $1,800 more. So that's a negative cash flow to the shareholders, 800 minus 1800 gives us a negative 1000 cash flow to shareholders. One more comment I want to make about this example is the difference between retained earnings and accumulated retained earnings. Retained earnings are happening during the year, so it's basically the money that we're adding into the vault and accumulated retained earnings, the figure on the balance sheet under the equity section is the money that we have in the vault, the money that we've accumulated over the years. So retained earnings happens during the year and accumulated retained earnings is the money that we have in the vault at that point in time. So make sure you differentiate between those two. Sometimes they'll give you, like in this example, the retained earnings that happen during the year, but sometimes they won't give you the retained earnings during the year or how much money you've added into the vault. They'll give you the accumulated retained earnings at the beginning of the year and the accumulated retained earnings at the end of the year. So the money you had in the vault at the beginning of the year and the money you have at the vault at the end of the year and you have to figure how much you've added into the vault by just subtracting those two figures. So that's it 
for the whole video. So a lot went on. Whenever you run into a question that's asking for one of these three cash flows or maybe all three, use this note that we took and then just plug in values into the corresponding formulas. Perhaps rewatch this video or parts of this video where it was really confusing. I think the most confusing and toughest part is probably this cash flow to shareholders when you have to deal with retained earnings. So maybe rewatch that portion of the video a few times. But uh, overall, it's not too bad. Just use this note whenever you run into that kind of question and use the corresponding formulas. Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for checking out my channel. Hopefully you got some value from the video you just watched. If you did get some value, big favor to ask you, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Any questions, any recommendations on things you'd like to see, please leave it in the comments section. Also check out the description box below for links to material and content related to the video you just watched. Peace out.